Well, in the words of St. Francis of Assisi, when he met St. Dominic on the road to Umbria, hi. <laughs> it's wonderful to be with you. I'm Richard Foster, and yes, I'm the Richard Foster that wrote Celebration of Discipline. I have to add that now because nobody recognizes me at all because of the length of my hair. And uh, if you're wondering, I might as well be right out and tell you why I haven't seen a barber recently. And it's not because I don't know what decade I'm living in. <laughs> Part of my background is Native American, even though I don't look like it particularly, but Ojibwa Nation. My wife, Carolyn, part of her background is Cherokee, whose ancestors walked that very famous and horrendous trail of tears. And so a while back, I just felt that allowing my hair to grow was a simple identification with that wonderful and glorious heritage. And over the years, it's become for me a little bit of a reminder to pray for First Nations peoples that the good news of Jesus might come in all of its fullness among these folk as well. Now, we're working in this series on the classical disciplines of the spiritual life. And I brought several friends along with me to help us in some of that teaching and interacting and thinking about the disciplines of the life. And I'll introduce them to you uh, as time goes on. But first, I think it's important for us to back up just a little to catch a vision, to catch a, a sense of what we're after in this life. Albert Einstein, the great physicist who gave us the mathematical equation for the theory of relativity, was once on a train. And when the conductor came by to collect the tickets, Einstein started searching through his pockets, couldn't find his ticket. Well, the man, the conductor, recognized him, you know. And he said, oh, Dr. Einstein, you don't need to find your ticket. I trust you. And he went on. About half an hour later, he comes back. By this time, Einstein's down on his hands and knees, looking under the seat to find his ticket. And the conductor said, Dr. Einstein, didn't you hear me? You don't need to find your ticket. I trust you. And Einstein looked up at him and said, young man, it's not a matter of trust. It's a matter of direction. I don't know where I'm going. <laughs> now, do you understand where you're going? Do we have a clear sense of the goal of the Christian life. The Apostle Paul said to the Galatians, I am in travail. Now that's a birthing image. I am in travail until Christ be formed in you. That's what we mean when we speak of spiritual formation. And to the Romans, Paul wrote, those whom God foreknew, them he predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. You, I, we are predestined to be like Jesus. And you see, God is intent upon that goal in your life and in my life. And God will continue to work with us and invite us into a cooperative relationship working together that we might be formed, that we might be conformed, that we might be transformed into the image of Jesus. Now, this is a great good to us because in this way, we begin to take on a whole new life. And we grow in grace. Remember the wonderful words of Peter in his tiny epistle, 2 Peter? Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, many people today can make no sense of a verse like that. 
because they're so accustomed to thinking of grace as unmerited favor. And it is that, isn't it? But it's so much more than that. How do you grow in unmerited favor? You don't. A student came up to me once and said, what happens after grace? <laughs> and I said to him, there is no after grace. See, we're not just saved by grace. We live by grace, this gifting of God upon our lives. And God invites us into this life to a cooperative relationship. And God has given to us means for our growth. You remember that Jonathan Edwards often spoke of God as a God of means. And John Wesley actually used the phrase means of grace. And the classical disciplines of the spiritual life are the primary means whereby we are enabled to bring this little individualized power pack, we call it the human body, and place it before God as a living sacrifice. Now, of course, the problem with living sacrifices is that they're always trying to crawl off the altar. <laughs> and that's why they take a lifetime to be offered. And so the disciplines of the spiritual life bring us into the means of grace for our growth. In grace. I'm thinking of inward experiences like meditation, meditatio, the ability to hear God's voice and to obey His word. Prayer, that interactive life with God in which we are working together with God to determine the outcome of events. Fasting, which is the voluntary denial of an otherwise normal function for the sake of intense spiritual activity. Study, which is the process whereby the mind takes on an order conforming to the order of whatever it concentrates upon. I'm also thinking of such outward experiences as simplicity, which is an inward reality that results in an outward lifestyle, or solitude, which creates an open, empty space where we can be found by God and where we can let go of competing loyalties. Submission, that wonderful discipline in which we are enabled to let go of that everlasting burden of always needing to get our own way. And service, which is the many little deaths of going beyond ourselves. I'm also thinking of such corporate experiences as worship, entering into the Shekinah of God, the glory of God. Experiences like guidance in which we begin to practice the presence of God with such clarity that it's like the cloud by day, and the pillar of fire by night. Confession, that wonderful discipline of the spiritual life in which the sorrows and sins of the past can be forgiven and healed. And celebration, that wonderful experience of walking and leaping and praising God. Now, I have no exhaustive list of the spiritual disciplines. And as far as I know, none exist. I don't know if you've heard the story of the man in the little Italian village who had no talent except that he could stand on his head. And one day the priest of the village went into the church and saw this man standing on his head before a statue of the Virgin Mary. Now, I wouldn't recommend that but it might do in a pinch. You understand? Ways by which we bring who we are, body, mind, and spirit, and place who we are before God. Now, at that point, the disciplines have come to the end of their tether. 
you see. The grace of God then steps into that and does things within us that we could never imagine. Now a spiritual discipline is doing what we can do with our body, our mind, our spirit. Doing what we can in order to receive from God power or resources to do what we can't in our own strength. You remember the Bible says, love your enemies. You know that's not in us to do that. And people sometimes will go out and try and fail miserably, and it's very discouraging, you see. No, no, we need a whole new resource of life, disciplines of the life. See, this is the righteousness of the kingdom of God through indirection. We undertake things we can do in order to receive from God power to do what we can. That's what a spiritual discipline is. And discipline in general is the ability to do what needs to be done when it needs to be done. That's what it is. You know, I can take a basketball and I can get it into a basketball hoop eventually. <laughs> I just can't take a basketball and get it into a basketball hoop when it needs to be gotten into the basketball hoop. See, that's what discipline is. It is the ability to be response-able, able to respond to the demands of life appropriately. As the moral philosopher said, doing the right thing in the right place at the right time for the right reason. And then spiritual disciplines then allow us to bring ourselves to receive grace and empowerment to do things we normally wouldn't. Now, the great enemy of the spiritual disciplines is legalism. See, when most people hear that phrase, spiritual disciplines, they're thinking of rigidity, not discipline. Rigidity is the first sign that the disciplines have gone to seed. I don't know if you know the story of Hans the tailor, very famous tailor in a city. So when an enterprising entrepreneur came to the city, he decided to get a tailor-made suit from Hans. Well, he went in, he got measured and fitted, and the next week when he came to pick up his suit, well, one shoulder kind of bunched up this way, the other sort of caved in. Uh, you know, it buckled here and there, but he didn't want to cause a fuss, so he paid his money, got on the bus to go back to the hotel. On the way back, someone came and tapped him on the shoulder and said, tell me, did Hans the tailor make that suit? And he said, well, yes, he did. And the man said, amazing. I knew that Hans was a great tailor, but I had no idea he could make a suit to fit perfectly someone as deformed as you. <laughs> now, you see, that's the way we do it so often. We have some experience with God, and that always comes in a context. It always comes in a wineskin because we're finite human beings. But then our tendency is to try to repeat that experience or to get others to have that same experience in that same way. And what we end up doing is pushing and shoving people until wonderfully they fit. Hmm? But you see, the life with God doesn't come that way. Jean-Pierre de Cussade in his wonderful book, The Sacrament, of the present moment said, and this is a definition of spiritual discipline, he said, the soul, light as a feather, fluid as water, innocent as a child, responds to every movement of grace like a floating balloon. Isn't that lovely? That we might be light as a feather, fluid as water, innocent as a child, responding to every movement of grace like a floating balloon. Now we need to ask the question of how we get started in this life. And the answer is right where we are. In the jobs that we have, in the families that we've been given, with our neighbors and our friends. Now I wish that that did not sound so trite. 
because it is the profoundest truth that we will ever know on a practical level of walking with God. I mean, we make such a mystery out of this business of the will of God. The surest sign that it is God's will for you to be where you are is that you're there. And you see, we want to throw that away. We say it can't be. God can't bless me where I am. When I graduate, then God will bless me. When I get this job, when I marry this person, when I pastor this church. Oh, no, no. The only place where God can bless you is right where you are. Because that's the only place you are. And if we can just come to see that right where we are, in our homes, in our work, with our neighbors and friends, that is where we will build a history with God. Do you remember Moses at the burning bush? God had to tell him to take off his shoes. He didn't know that it was holy ground. Now, that's it. If we can come to see right where we are is holy ground. Now, George Scramstead and Jim Stewart have come and joined us, and they're going to be leading us in some worship experiences. George is from Oklahoma City. One of the things I love about George is his heart for worship. And I'm wondering, George, can you lead us in that song, Holy Ground? Let us pray. 
Yeah. Well, you know, I don't think I've ever asked you if I have, I've forgotten. Where did the title Celebration of Discipline come from? Because, <laughs> you know, that's an ingenious gift <laughs> to put those two words together. Yeah, it's a very interesting. <laughs> uh, originally, I had thought of the title The Liberty of Discipline. No, that's good too. Because, because yes. I wanted people to see mm -hmm. how discipline moves us to liberation. Mm -hmm. Uh, we felt that probably the word liberty, especially at that period of time, some, mm -hmm. what, 25 years ago or so, might have some political connotations that, that didn't, mm -hmm. we didn't but want. And see, that uh, in philosophy, it has long been understood among moral philosophers that the person of the greatest virtue is the person who is most free. Exactly. And there's a real deep connection between these, and of course, virtue. It doesn't come through except through discipline. Right. And and actually the word freedom was also, you know, mm -hmm. thought about. But finally, we just sort of settled on celebration. Well, I think it's a wonderful, <laughs> a great and, I mean, it wasn't like we uh, had really <laughs> planned it. We no. just sort of, sort of well, worked with I'm it. Well, I'm sure God was giving it to you. Yeah. That's... Uh, Yep. His wisdom in that in that book. <laughs> well, you know, back in those early days, we did a lot of that kind of celebrating. Yeah. I mean, there was a lot of hard times, a lot of struggle with people, but there were breakthroughs. That yes. Well, it was a big breakthrough for me to understand that celebration is actually a discipline. Yes, exactly, you know? exactly. Uh, because from my uh, own background... Um, <laughs> You didn't think of celebration as a discipline. Right, right. But well, of course, uh, when you understand the gospel and the invitation to live in the kingdom of God mm -hmm, and all of mm -hmm. that, you understand that celebration is one of the really great ways of coming to know God and uh, of walking with God. Throwing a party throwing in God's honor. That's yeah, exactly yeah. right. 